Hi, my name is John Johnson, and I want to talk to you for the next series of lectures about leadership. I've had, perhaps like you, a fascination with the subject. Uh, I have, I've been ex involved in leading uh, much of my life, e even back to grade school days. I seem to have been drawn to read any and everything I can find about leadership. There's something about leadership that uh, becomes almost, as one writer put it, an obsession that is both national and global. We can't seem to get uh, enough about leadership. And maybe it's because our, our lives are so defined by it. The news is so shaped by it. Uh, just looking today at the morning headlines, uh, I read about a South American leader who has just been elected and everything is gonna hinge on what direction he takes the country. Or I look at our own American leadership and there is this discussion of whether he can get us out of our economic crisis. Or reading uh, another headline about uh, the Pope and the question is, uh, will he retire? Will he, he stay on? We, we want to know what leaders are doing, what they're asking, what we should expect, because so much of life seems to center around them. And yet, for all the interest, for all the continual churning out of leadership books and all the conferences, the millions spent, in fact, billions, leadership, I think I've read is somewhere like a $50 billion industry. Hardly a day goes by. Isn't it ironic? Hardly a day goes by that there's not some commentary on yet another leadership lapse, a failure of leadership, a governor, a president, a mayor, a business leader, a religious leader. I just think this last week of, of a large Protestant denomination after an independent investigation is beginning to discover a huge amount of pastoral abuse. So the irony is we have all of this interest, all of these books, all of these sessions and conferences, and yet it seems like we still haven't figured out leadership. And so the question is, what explains this? And there are a lot of reasons, uh, a lack of solid academic training perhaps, that's at least how academicians want to describe it, or a propensity to please followers that leaders can fall into, maybe a leader's own self-interest, certainly the moral decline of our age, but the conviction of what I've written here in Rooted Leadership is it's deeper, it's spiritual. Uh, rare, as I've noted, is a book grounded in sound theology. So from the very beginning, I went on this quest for about the last three years to just study leadership with, in a sense, a theology book in one hand and really good books on leadership on the other. And it's rooted out of a conviction that leadership is actually something that God designed. And therefore, he has a lot to say about it. And it is actually something that's sacred. So the working material comes from the revelation of God, but also from, as I mentioned, good secular uh, scholarship. And the supposition here is that there's a lot to learn from both. And while there's a lot to learn from secular leadership in particular, uh, I, I decided at the beginning, not really I decided, it's just obvious right there in Scripture, that theology is, has to be the principal resource. Yeah, so the intent is both to uh, complement and, and contrast between what we see out there in the field of secular leadership and thinking through it from a theological side. So these lectures are going to cover some core questions, questions that I believe every leader uh, ha asks and every leader has to find some accurate answers. So we'll begin with a, a sensible first question, and that is, what is the logical foundation for approaching leadership? It's a logical place to start. We always think at the beginning of foundations. And when I think about foundations that are solid and foundations that are, are flawed. I think uh, of my experience living in the Netherlands, where there is uh, what's called the Damrik Canal in Amsterdam. And you'll find these, if you've been a tourist and gone by, you see these iconic houses graced with their gabled facades. And it all looks good until you step back and you realize they're, they're tilted. 
And, and there's a good reason for that. The, when they were originally constructed, uh, they were built on wooden stilts that were, well, they were driven into former swampland. And something like that in a similar way is going on with leadership. There's, there's a flawed foundation. Something has become crooked. And, and it's evidenced in so much of the leadership we see. So I want to begin with this question then, how did we, how did we come into this crisis? And there are a number of reasons, uh, but I'd like to focus on two. And the first is, and it's a lot of it is our culture, we become enamored with practice over theory. We, we like things that are pragmatic. We want to get to what works. That's what drives us. But we begin to realize it only goes so far. We're losing our capacity to think deeply. What I see in the field of pastoral theology, for example, more and more are students who want to come, but they just want to get to methodology. They want to find out what works. They want to go out and be a success. And, and that's just the problem. It's the same in leadership. We, we need to start at least with some credible theory. And we need to replace some of the resources that are just solely devoted to the practical with something that at least helps us to think more from a foundational side. Because pragmatic lessons are not, a, not enough. So we, and, and we know this because, again, what we're seeing is a lot of incompetence in leadership today. So the reality is that good methodology and sound theory uh, are both necessary. I'm certainly not arguing just for theory because that's not very helpful either. So it requires, first of all, a, a, an intellectual inquiry, if we could put it that way, uh, that includes the disciplines uh, not just in theology, but when you study leadership, you need to look at history, you need to look at sociology and psychology and business. But I would say above all, you have to look at theology. I think of James McGregory Burns, who in his uh, massive work on leadership, one of the most important books, puts it this way, that uh, what is necessary today more than ever is intellectual leadership, the kind that is studied that's reflective, that's imaginative, that leads to what then he calls transformative leadership. Or I like this statement, in the end, nothing is as practical as good theory. So this is where it has to start. And so that's part of the reason for the problem. The other part of the problem we are dealing with is that we've replaced God's wisdom with man's wisdom. That, again, is the driver behind uh, these, these lectures and what I want to say here. We have given a greater priority to, when it comes to leadership especially, of going to business books, of going to uh, the different uh, options on Amazon or bookstores and looking for books about leadership without thinking about the theological side. It's as if when you look at most leadership books, Leadership and theology have a really hard time coexisting. And so many of the leadership books I've read over the years uh, say next to nothing about God or theology. And that has led to consequences. Leaders uh, are increasingly graduating without a moral compass. Even if you read uh, uh, professors at Stanford in leadership, or as I mentioned, Harvard, you'll find in their books like J uh, Jeffrey Pfeffer's or Barbara Kellerman, that they, they lament that somehow their graduates are going out, and, and they're going out without a, a solemnity of, of manner and purpose. And while they may have the theory down, it's still nonetheless leading to toxic workplaces and harsh and abusive leaders and questionable business practices. So even in the secular realm, they're coming to realize something's not, not right here. And how did this happen? Well, we, we know that historically, theology once did have a seat at the table. In fact, theology was at the head of the table. In fact, you could say theology, as was often said, was the queen of the sciences, the crown of the curriculum, the authoritative authoritative voice on every subject, including leadership. 
But over time, gradually, other disciplines filled the void. Uh, I think of Miroslav Volf, who is a professor at Yale Divinity School, who made this observation recently. He said the general sense, and he's talking about how in his realm, uh, in his environment, how scholars look at theology. He said the general sense, uh, catch what he says here, the general sense is that theology isn't producing any genuine knowledge that accomplishes anything. Wow, that's pretty strong. That it trades with the irrationality of faith and it's useless. So therefore, maybe we shouldn't be so surprised in an average leadership book, we don't see much mention of God or theology. And to make matters worse, Christianity as a whole is losing its credibility in culture. So they kind of combine together to make for a diminishing influence. Now, the unfortunate thing is that, in a sense, when you look at theological institutions, it's, it's as if we've returned the favor, and that uh, it's hard to find a lot of theological curriculums that include leadership, uh, with also, in a sense, saying, well, why would we have leadership in our curriculum were more about other things from exegesis to uh, theology to pastoral training? And so what, we, what this has led to is uh, an increasing number of churches that don't understand leadership either. And that's apparent in pastors who, frankly, just don't have a clue how to lead a church. And it's hard to be really critical of them because they've never learned leadership. So if you're following, I ha we see this gap on both sides, both in the secular world that dismisses theology and the spiritual or religious world that, that dismisses leadership. So what needs to happen? Uh, we need to, first of all, establish back a solid foundation. Uh, we need to recognize there is a critical place for theory, uh, that foundations are necessary if we're gonna build structures that are straight. Uh, that's the first place. Uh, so we need to honor uh, learning. Secondly, we need to reverse our priorities and honor the precedents of, of theology, one that is committed to, to rigorous logical thinking, one that asks the hard questions that ultimately matter. Uh, theology isn't just about providing the answers. Really good theology has to, first of all, genuinely ask the hard questions. So in this case here, what could the world be with the right leadership? Uh, what was the role of leadership from the beginning? Let's say all the way back to Genesis. How does leadership play a role in the pursuit of a life that flourishes? How does God use leadership? What was God's intentions for leadership from the beginning? And, and there's good reason theology has to have priority because when you step back, theology frames all of life's subjects, not just leadership, but everything. Ultimately, everything starts with a solid theology. Uh, I like Thomas Oden, who once put it this way, God minus the world is God, but the world minus God is nothing. And he's right. So th we go to theology. We must start with theology when it comes to leadership because it frames everything. Secondly, it provides this overarching leadership theory. That is, it takes us to the core, to the root rooted leadership, to the heart of leadership. For more than any other discipline, theology describes the way things actually are. It gives leadership, as with all subjects, a transcendent meaning that takes us from our earthboundness and it helps to see from God's perspective. And, and the point I'm making here is that any fundamental principles and manners of leadership have to begin with God because, again, leadership is God's idea. Consider this, that God made uh, us in his image and he entrusted us with sovereignty over the rest of creation, Genesis 1.28. So even at the very beginning of our identity, 
what we were made for, who we are, going back to the image of God, goes back to leadership. The sage, in fact, put it bluntly, it's by God that leaders lead, uh, Proverbs 8, 15, and 16. And when we look, for example, at the, the life of Jesus, Jesus came as the leader par excellence. He's the essence, the pole star of leadership. Without, without a theological orientation, then we're a mess when it comes to leading. We morph into something else. Like Catholic theologian Henry Nouwen uh, was speaking to a group of leaders in Washington, D.C. a number of years ago, and he was asked to speak on leadership. And this is what he, he warned them. He said that without a theological reflection, without this foundation, future leaders will think of themselves as simply enablers, as facilitators, as role models, as father or mother figures, or big brothers or big sisters. True leadership can be only understood in terms of a rooted theological vision of God. So we go to theology because it, it, it shapes everything. It clarifies the main reasons for leadership. It corrects the notion that leaders uh, lead for themselves. They lead actually for the glory of God. They are created not to take charge, but to use their positions of power and influence, not for self-enrichment, but to be summoned to serve the purposes of God. They are summoned to subdue and rule. This gets to the origin of leadership, but they are here to serve and guide creation to become the creation God fully intended. Finally, theology places leadership really in its true context. When you study leadership, many leadership books will underscore the point that one has to understand the context for leadership. But only in theology do we have the meta-narrative, right? The whole story that begins with the very beginning of creation. And it's only in this meta-narrative, in the whole story, that we then see really the context, that then can we really understand leadership. And in scripture, we see these series of acts all the way through uh, in which leadership was critical. It, it's in this narrative we understand how leadership got off the rails with sin, uh, how uh, God has chosen Israel to be the alternative and to be the agent and light, and its leaders are called to be the alternative leaders. And then we see Jesus in another act in creation, the leader of leaders, who brings to perfect expression what God requires of all who lead. And then we move into this sweep, this broad narrative to the post-resurrection acts of Jesus, who ascends and sends the Spirit and gives birth to the church and calls the church to be uh, royal priests, that is, leaders who uh, are worshipers. And so this is the context we need to go back to, find our, get our bearings from, our foundation. They serve as the reference point for leading. And then we need to learn not only from theology, but from great lives. Uh, and theology tells us, uh, gives us many stories of leaders, good and bad, to learn from. So we need to learn from them. Yes, we need to discover the commonalities uh, and differences between secular and theological scholarship. I have benefited greatly from what secular leaders have to say and writers about leadership. And there are a lot of things we agree on, but there are core differences. Uh, and so theology places uh, every subject under searing critique uh, that there's an ultimate reality, it's God, not man, that there is no authority other than God's, that as with humanity, a leader's first allegiance is to God, that successful leadership is not a matter of fate, but a matter uh, of faith. So we come to realize uh, more and more as we look at theology and look at leadership that theology doesn't have a place at the table it sits at the head of the table. It is, it is the necessary foundation.